Okay, this presentation is uh, just basically uh, a review of the visit I had with the Flying Animal Foundation uh, in February 2014. My visit, it was planned following a meeting I had with uh, Bernard uh, de Verne at LOEX uh, Congress in Germany 2012. Uh, and I planned this visit uh, to go to Roger Stone the Flying Animal Foundation with uh, Taylor Keenan, who's a, uh, an American farrier. Now, the Flying Anvil Foundation was uh, founded in 2010 by uh, Bernard de Verne, uh, a Swiss farrier. And the Flying Anvil Foundation, it targets farriers that are working in remote countries that may need some additional training and additional help and support. Um, and this gives this opportunity in these remote countries for farriers to be able to, to learn farry properly and correctly. And uh, Bernard had a lot of experience with this from Previously, he'd worked in many, many countries um, where he'd seen farriers that were was, was, was struggling with, with with their skills and um, the opportunities that maybe a lot of farriers in, in the Western world take advantage of. Um, Bernard had worked in Honduras, uh, Iran, South Africa, Yemen, Mongolia, China, uh, Morocco, and Mexico. So many, many countries where you know, farrier education uh, just, just doesn't exist. So the, the, uh, the Flying Anvil Foundation at the Farry Institute in Godlod, it's, uh, it trains a singular group of farriers uh, each year. It's a year-long course, uh, and this is restricted to a maximum of, of, of 12 student farriers. And this uh, ca is carried out by uh, four weeks, sorry, four lots of two-week training courses. Uh, so it's modular that take place over, over a year. Um, and that's, at the end of that, there's a a formal examination which gives those attending students a professional certification. And the volunteers that go to go to Rajasthan to work at the Institute uh, have come from, from many, many different countries um, such as Scandinavia, um, Europe, America uh, and Australia. Uh, and each volunteer uh, gets two weeks of their time uh, to teach at the Institute uh, throughout, throughout the year. Uh, the Flying Animal Foundation would not be able to function without the valuable support of, uh, of many of its sponsors, uh, which not only have helped fund the Institute, but are also able to um, cover the expenses uh, for the volunteers. All the volunteers that, that partake, um, they're not paid for it, they, they're given their, given their time freely. Uh, obviously there's expenses just in purely just flying um, the volunteers out there to be able to teach the students. Um, for the first two years, uh, there would be two, two volunteers would go out uh, to help teach each module. Uh, but in an effort to make the projects out there more sustainable, only one, volu well, only one overseas volunteer needs to go out to, to the Institute because we've now got students who have got the ability to be able to assist those volunteers that are, that are going over there. Uh, now, the Institute itself, it started, uh, construction started in, in 2012, uh, and the institute was, was built on land uh, that, was, uh, that was given by uh, Bonnie Singh Dunlod, who's been a yeah, massive help to the, to the Flying Animal Foundation in establishing uh, an institute out there. It took around about a year uh, of construction to, to have the institute up and running, and uh, the institute is it's set opposite um, Bonnie's own personal stables, and uh, you know, Bonnie allows a lot of students to access his own personal stables and personal horses to be able to, to work on. The inauguration uh, of the Institute took place in, in April 2014. Uh, this is the outside of the building where it's all completely finished and, and nicely decorated. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't as nice looking as this when we, were, when we attended, uh, but it's still, still being constructed. And uh, in part of the in inauguration, it, you know, it's three days of celebration with dancing horses, uh, tent pegging, uh, forging demonstrations and, and dissections that, that took place and um, you know, to show the, the many visitors that came to see the Institute being open. Now, over, the half, half, over half of the human population still depends on, on its animal power for just for, you know, for its day-to-day -day activity. So you've got over 100 million horses and donkeys that are still used for transporting um, people, food, material, water, etc. So a lot of the world is still very, very dependent on basic horsepower. Uh, it's maybe you know 
carrying heavy loads. Uh, these horses are working in very busy and very, very hot environments and working in fairly hostile conditions. And very, very, yeah, very, very harsh environment. Um, people, they depend upon their horses to be able to provide them with a living. Um, it may, yeah, it makes a difference between here yeah, getting their children education, educated, and then get the children to school, um, or to watch over their their livestock, to work the land. And in these countries with yeah, limited resources, every animal has its uses. Now, the Flying Animal Foundation, its objective is to pr promote professional competence and training in these countries. Uh, as a lot of these countries, uh, there's literally no recognition of, of Harry as being a professional. So when you work in these countries, yeah, it's common to see very, very damaged and distorted feet. And it's expected that these horses have to work uh, despite, you know, often having very, very uh, acute and, and chronic pathology. And these horses are shod with you know, local materials. Um, it may be like rebar, and in 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 these cases, uh, I've seen you know, car tires that have been cut up to, that have been attached to horses' feet to you know to allow them to work and to keep sound. Um, often the you know, the shoes on these horses' feet aren't fitted at all correctly. Uh, often, lots of the time, the shoes are left on far too long, literally until the actual shoes physically you know, fall off the feet. And you know, there's a very, very, very little understanding of, of any Farrery protocols, um, knowledge of any anatomy or biomechanics and d disease. Just it just does not exist. In a lot of these countries, yeah, there is there is a certain amount of skill there, um, but this skill needs to be refined. Um, purely by education, trying to educate the farriers and the people you know, who, who own these horses to do you know, what, what is best for these horses, you know, still using whatever local um, materials are available to them. Uh, and in a lot of these countries, you know, there's, you've got to work on your own. There's no, often there's no vets um, to assist or even to sedate horses. A lot of the horses that you know, we end up working with are, you know, are still stallions and you're working alongside mares. So yeah, there yeah, can be a lot of issues, you know, a lot of problems. And uh, you know, Farrery in all these different countries is very, very different to you know, what we would normally ex expect to see in a, you know, in, a Western, in, a Western, in a Western world. The local people, you know, they're trying to achieve the best that they can with the facilities they have available to them. And often, yeah, the farry profession is learnt from one generation down to the next. Um, yeah, as I said earlier, yeah, the ability is there, but often the knowledge is is lost when that information is transferred down to the next generation. Um, there's often a, yeah, a lack of a lack of techniques, um, that much yeah, thought for, for for what the horse has to do, or of the horse itself. Um, a lot of the times, what you know, what the farriers are doing with these horses, it may work uh, in the short term using very, very simple techniques. Uh, but often, this is you know to the detriment of the horses, you know, and 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 to the owners of these horses, which you know, which rely on the on, on the horses for their you know for their for their daily needs, for their daily work. Um, and these are some of the slides here yeah, that were taken. Uh, in in India, there's no real regard for you know, health and safety or anything like that. I mean, these guys are you know, happily working away with the most simple of tools, uh, barefooted uh, in a fairly fairly precarious and dangerous position. The first impressions of India um, was mainly this, just the complete chaos, um, the, the driving. Um, there's no acknowledgement of any sort of traffic regulations. There's a constant use of horns. Uh, there's a, yeah, quite a lot of rubbish everywhere uh, and quite a lack of, uh, of sanitation. And the other thing was just that, that there just seemed to be animals just, and people, where everywhere we looked. And um, it was just, it was just, yeah, a lot of quite, 
quite amusing just to see you know cows dogs pigs goats camels elephants wherever you know wherever you looked you know, walking down the streets maybe sat in the middle of a roundabout uh, maybe walking down the road towards you as you're driving along and uh, you know, India, India itself it seems to be thrive on a very a very very dynamic existence uh, you've got some very very strong smells <clears throat> constant you know sounds all the time uh, you know, lots of very 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 vibrant colors and it's yeah it's very very hot during the daytime <clears throat> and very very yeah very very dusty as well but the people themselves you know despite the obvious po poverty are you know are very 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 happy um, and it's very common for you know for small young children uh, are expected to work uh, either you know, either individually um, or they'll work along with it with, with you know work with their families in, in one of their their occupations may well be um, when Taylor and I we, when we eventually got to to Dunlod 4 um, it was absolutely amazing building uh, it's built in the 1700s uh, the family that still live you know family that still lived there from the original people that built it uh, descended from uh, Rajasthan royalty uh, it's absolutely massive place and it's also home of the Marwari horse which I had never I'd heard about uh, through discussions with Bernard but I never actually sort of you know, just seen one before until I got out to uh, to the you know, to the Institute uh, <clears throat> now our rooms uh, were placed right at the very very top of the fort um, yeah pretty basic bedrooms so we had a, we had a bathroom we had you know, had a had a bed um, but the, yeah, the views from our rooms were, yeah, were absolutely amazing. And this is the views that we saw you know, literally out of our bedroom windows every day. Um, it's quite surprising how cold it was uh, you know, during, during the night. Uh, you say you had a hat and a coat, but uh, and in the morning it's still a bit sharp. But uh, as the sun got under the sky, it certainly, you know, certainly got very, very warm. Um, because of how old the, court, the, the fort was, uh, it was very strongly fortified with uh, two outer walls, uh, and would have, you know, back in the day would have had a huge number of, of, of res residents and servants that would have been living there to look after um, those that were living at the fort uh, at the time. Uh, so the first day was just mainly taking time to get uh, acclimatised, uh, recovering from the jet lag. Uh, it was uh, surprisingly very very cold uh, overnight. And, and very cold first thing in the morning, uh, but it quickly quickly warmed up uh, as the sun yes as the sun got into the sky. But uh, mornings were still here yeah, surprisingly chilly. Uh, Dunlod it's a it's a small town uh, of about of about approximately twenty five thousand people. Um, very very busy, very sort of densely populated. Uh, people always very very walked out the fort. They were very very interested in uh, in us. They wanted to talk to us and. Uh, they wanted to practice our Eng their English with us, and we're always asking, always asking for for pens. But we were very, 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 very friendly, and yeah, happy, and always smiling. Um, now the economics in in India were completely, completely different to you know, what we used to in in in, in the Western world. Uh, yeah, litres of petrol was like seven cents. That's the equivalent of about five pence in the UK. You have a cup of tea for nine cents. Uh, you have a complete haircut and shave for seventy cents. Uh, bottles of beer. We we're very fortunate enough to be able to find uh, somewhere where we could purchase <laughs> purchase beer. Um, but to, to show a horse, put four new shoes on a horse. You look in the yeah, around about the equivalent of about about four dollars, uh, about three pounds of British money, and uh, and a and a, a farrow, even though it's not a really recognised. Um, job a, re, a, a recognized occupation in India uh, monthly salary is around about two hundred and fifty dollars which is which is seen as yeah a good a good earning to make um, and the per yeah you know, to buy a donkey one hundred and ten dollars or a camel slightly more expensive about five hundred and seventy dollars uh, I was able to get a shave when I was out there it's 30, 30 cents to have a shave and uh, whilst I was sat in the chair I had a massive big uh, load of I think like the equivalent of chewing tobacco shoved shoved down the corner of my mouth, which felt like it was burning through my jawbone for the duration of my shave. Um, so first day at work, um, I thought Bernard was joking when he said that this is our our transportation down to the the Farrier Institute in Dudlock, but uh, didn't seem to be the case. This was our transportation. 
Um, so horse or cart, it took us down uh, to the Institute down through the main streets of Dundlod for a very, very bumpy ride. Uh, and we were accompanied by a lot of smiles and, and waving hands from, from the villagers. Um, and down at the Institute, uh, it was still being built whilst we were there. Uh, um, the construction workers were, were, were migrants from another part of India um, and they, they, lived on, they lived on site. Um, on the left was where they got their water from, and on the right hand side was the yeah, that was literally their their kitchen, their entire kitchen to to yeah to cook food for approximately thirty people. Uh, and it's just yeah, it's just expected for you know, for men and men to be able to they all they all work together, they all eat they all eat together, but they're all yeah very 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 happy and, and friendly. Uh, and it's expected that you know, men, women, and all children all work to, all work together, helping out. Uh, it's complete complete equality. Uh, all seem very very happy to be doing the jobs that they were doing. Um, one of the big things about India is just the complete lack of any sort of mechanisation. Um, the smallest of jobs are extremely labour intensive um, at the Farry Institute there was a, the children children of workers that were there uh, they're always smiling and dancing they're playing in the sand building things uh, they're always very very happy to to get, yeah, receive some sweets or receive a piece of chewing gum and whilst the, whilst the workers were you know were, were building the Institute um, they also they also lived on site um, so they actually lived lived within what they were building um, and simple simple shelters you know, such as these uh, provided some you know, very very basic accommodation for the workers you know, to, to, to live and exist whilst the institute was being built. The body stables were they were on the opposite side across a small narrow road opposite the institute uh, and these were the, the Mawari horses. Um, what's most distinctive about them is their, their crescent ears uh, we should turn in and touch one another, and uh, yeah, very, very, very kind temperament. Within the stables, uh, all the horses were, were bedded down on on sand. Uh, they all appeared to be very, very well cared for. Uh, there was quite a high number of staff looking after all the horses, and they were fed, and watered, groomed, you know, mucked out, mucked out regularly, and seemed, you know, seemed very, very happy. So we were able to work on the horses um, over over at the stables. Uh, we had a, a, a concrete area in which we were able to assess horses, uh, trim horses, and shoe horses upon. Um, the staff there were very very accommodating in in providing us with horses and be able to hold horses whilst we worked upon them. Um, so our our, our group um, we had a, a group of seven students, um, including Sahib. Uh, who was our translator, and uh, he he'd attended previous courses uh, the year before 2013, uh, run run at the same institute uh, by the Flying Animal Foundation, uh, and out of this group of students, um, four had had fairly intermediate skills, uh, and three three were com complete novices, had no experience of, of horseshoeing uh, whatsoever. Um, so on the first day, basically, we're getting the students with that had some experience uh, to to get under horses, um, and then with the, those students that were very very novice, uh, they need a lot of a lot of hand holding just to be able to get them to um, approach horses safely, specific guidance on just you know, on on horse safely safety, uh, so they were able to approach horses and be able to you know, pick up their feet etc. without causing the horse any distress. And most importantly, not allowing them to be in a, in a position of, of danger. Um, we we discussed you know, just basic anatomical terms with the horses, uh, just such as hoof wall, coronary band, the white line, sole, pastern, and and fetlock. And the students were yeah they had they all, most of them had mobile phones with which they were able to um, yeah archive any of the any of the images of of, of trimming the feet. Um, yeah, to relate back to regarding sort of anatomy, how to trim a frog, how to trim the, trim the sole, etc., how to be able to identify you know, the white line. 
Um, we had Sa Sahib, who was who was our translator. Um, most of the students did have yeah, a, a sort of fairly sort of rough rough idea of being able to speak speak English. Uh, some spoke no English whatsoever. Uh, so we, Sahib was absolutely fantastic translator. So he was able to translate into from English into 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 Hindi uh, for the students. But obviously this did take a little bit longer uh, than you yeah, than you normally expect if they were able to understand what we were saying. Um, but yeah, Sahib did absolutely fantastic job. Uh, now I don't think any of the students had ever actually fall. Um, anything before. So just to sort of give them a, an idea on on forging, um, I got them just to forge a, just a basic hoof pick um, out of rebar. So I just drew the various steps on on how to make a, a hoof pick uh, and I completed one steps um, whilst the students watch and then they would then replicate what I had done. Uh, whilst I was doing this, both Taylor and I were sure that they were able to hold the steel correctly, where to place it on the anvil, how to work safely, uh, and just being able to yeah, maintain uh, working a forge uh, and making sure that the steel that they were working with was was the correct the correct correct temperature. Uh, student, the students were really really keen, uh, and they learned they learned very very quickly. Um, a tailor had, had attended the Hooshcare Summit in Cincinnati, um, I think the month, the month before, and, and Chris Gregory very kindly donated uh, two of his uh, textbook on Fowry books. Uh, these were given to the, the library of the Flying Anvil Foundation, the still to this day now, yeah, are referred to and are very, very useful for the new students that are coming through the Institute. It was really great to see the students become confident and yeah, just be able to you know, see their confidence more than anything grow with just achieving a fairly sort of relatively you know, simple task as, as, as forging, a, you know, forging a hoof pick. And it was good just to yeah, just be able to identify their, you know, their hand-eye coordination, etc., and just be able to allow them just to be able to, to create something. The Dan Lord has got, it's got one very small internet cafe. Uh, it's got fairly sporadic opening hours. Uh, this allow, it did us allow us to have some sort of contact with the outs, outside world. Um, and it's quite funny, the first time we, we, we went to, the, to use the cafe, we were, we were followed by a, a few locals and uh, we were on our iPads and all the rest of it. And when we looked up, there was sort of two or three, two or three deep, just sort of looking at, at what we were doing. So I think it was just, yeah, it hadn't, it was just weren't very used to, to outsiders. It's such a, it's such a, a rural, uh, situation uh, in Dunlod. Uh, the sanitation in India is completely, completely different to what I was used to. Uh, there's a lot of wastewater uh, around. As a result, the water table has got you know, sort of dangerously low, uh, and the landscape is uh, extremely arid. The ultimate may be in recycling uh, manure from 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 the animals, cattle, pigs, horses, etc. It's made into patties and it's dried out uh, on walls around the village. And uh, this provides fuel for, for both cooking uh, and also provides heat during the often quite cold evenings. And the toilets and sewage, are, again, are very, very different and appear you know, quite primitive to what you'd expect in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in the Western world. And um, Open sewers and, and no 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 toilet paper is a is a very sort of a common common occurrence. Now rainfall is is fairly un, uncommon, but it did occur during our during our visit. Uh, it's just a, a photograph of sort of the the, the main square. Um, so during the daytime, uh, when it's obviously when it's not chucking now in rain, um, there's a small market where you can you can buy vegetables and uh, and you also buy buy cooked food. It normally get dark around about 6:30, and uh, the time that we were there, the forge didn't have any didn't have any lights, uh, and power cuts are, are really common out there. Uh, you'd probably we'd normally experience several power cuts of, per day, uh, which is not great when you're sort of up when it's dark and trying to have a shave, and all of a sudden the, the, the lights go out. So sort of shaving by candle became a fairly common occurrence. 
Uh, but during the evening times, we'd, we'd all we'd eat, eat together uh, every night, and we'd talk about what we'd experienced during the day, uh, and as well as just being able to find out you know, a little bit more about one another because I think you know we'd all had we all came from extremely different backgrounds uh, so it's really really extremely interesting to hear you know hear their life stories hear where they're from here you know, how they came to find themselves uh, trained to be farriers uh, in Rajasthan. Now one of the first horses uh, that was sh that was shot uh, was actually the pony stallion which took us to the institute on the first day um, it had been previously shod, I think, by I think in, in November time previously, on the previous course. Um, it only actually had a half a shoe on one front foot, uh, and the other three feet were very, very worn down, you know, primarily because of the very, very the hard ground, very arid and very, very dry. Um, and his feet were really, really quite small, uh, around about two and a half inches wide. Um, and we shot him with uh, four just regular plain stamp shoes. Um, these were forged out of half inch round uh, rebar uh, with a slightly rolled toe, which I've never really forged anything out of rebar before, and it's uh, not the easiest of things to to accomplish. Yeah, he was the first. He was the first horse shot at the institute, uh, and he was trimmed and shot by the, interme the intermediate students. Uh, the rebar was really very, very hard, um, and the stamps and the pritchels that they used were, were fairly wrecked after just making these shoes. Now, the following day, uh, myself and, and Bernard, um, with the four intermediate farriers, we went to a, a stables uh, in a town called, or a big village called Navalgar. Uh, they had a number of dancing horses there. Uh, this one had quite, had chronic laminitis. Uh, and it had previously been taken to a to a local hospital um, to have just analog X-rays uh, taken with its front feet. And I said previously, there's no you can't just ring a vet out and get a vet vet to come and take out some nice digital X-rays of your horse. Uh, in this case, you had to go to the local hospital. Uh, now this horse had previously been shod by a by a graduate from the institute. Um, he was shod uh, with a reversed open toed bar shoe. Uh, with a plate welded uh, in front of the frog over a very, very thin sole. Much of the time when working away from the Institute, horses are, are shot on on sand. So, you know, if we go out to the stables, the, the conditions aren't great. Uh, it does make it very difficult to, to properly evaluate confirmation. Uh, it doesn't make work particularly easy either. Uh, it was really interesting to see how how horses were stabled in, in India. Um, they're all tied up very, very differently to uh, what I'd seen previously. Uh, they all seem very relaxed. Often they lay sleeping in the sand and the horses and their legs and bodies were decorated with, with henna for when they're performing at, uh, at weddings. And it was a really harmonious stable. So there was plenty of coming and going. Um, everyone was, was, was busy mucking out. Uh, feeding and grooming the horses, just going around their day-to-day, yeah, their day-to-day -day business. Well, one of the highlights of the day was 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 seeing an elephant. I've never really seen an elephant up close in person before. Uh, and this wedding was brought in. It was part. It was uh, taking part in a wedding. Uh, and she was a 35-year-old female elephant called Hearty. Um, as I believe, so Bernard told me that all female elephants in India are called. And um, again, you can see across her, her ears and, and down her trunk, she was you know, she was decorated for the role that she was going to be carrying out at the wedding. And as it was a Saturday, there were plenty of children milling about at the at the stables, and they were all very very interested in what these these white guys were doing, you know, with their horses' feet. And the family who owned the stables, they they cooked us a really superb lunch, uh, which was cooked in in simple clay pots. Uh, on an open fire outside and it was really it was really very very humbling to be able to be a part of these these families lives just just for the day and to be able to you know to be able to help them and and again it was very very humbling for them to cook us a meal and, and be so polite and, and kind to us at Dunlods it's 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 mainly Hindu uh, with a fairly significant Muslim demographic uh, religion is a, it's a very important uh, Part of day-to-day -day life. Um, Taylor and I would often be 
awoken by the, the call, to bre call to pray, which would occur at the start of each day. Um, now one of the first things that did strike us in India was, was, was the driving and was the vehicles. Um, they're not probably the most roadworthy of vehicles generally. And, uh, and it always, whatever the vehicle is, it always tends to be completely overladen, either with, with goods or with people. Uh, I think we did see some motorbikes, I think with maybe as many as six people, you know, carrying, you know, carrying six people. Uh, again, this is likewise with, with you know, trains and buses, often, you know, often they have numerous people standing and sitting you know, up on their roofs, and this is just seen as the norm. We had a day off on the Sunday, um, and we were able to hire, hire a driver for the day, uh, just to take us out and sightsee. Uh, we called this garage just to, to fill up with petrol, uh, and we came across this gentleman uh, who was out delivering eggs. I don't think I've ever seen a, a motorbike quite full of, uh, it's quite so full of so many eggs. Uh, but in India, it's you know, not particularly a, that an uncommon sight. And driving through rural India, it gave us a chance to observe locals in traditional traditional dress and uh, you know, various modes of transport. Um, we were able to visit a a well, uh, which is, you know, would have been beautifully built a few hundred years ago, um, and it would have been full of water. Uh, but now it's you know, it's run dry due to the very very um, arid environment, uh, and it was in a very very poor poor state of repair. Uh, it was full of rubbish and defaced with graffiti, which is really really sad to see. But yeah, not that uncommon to see many of the buildings uh, in this sort of in this sad state of affairs, just purely due to yeah, a lack of uh, lack of money, lack of resources to maintain them. Uh, they're very, very elaborate, and uh, it is uh, sad to see them falling into into this sort of disrespect, disrepair. Uh, and next door to the well was a, it was a temple, um, the Hindu temple, into which we were, we were we were invited into into and uh, and then blessed. Uh, and this was on on route to a to a to a holy place, which was uh, up in the mountains, uh, which is full of. Pilgrims, snake charmers, uh, still selling various spices and you know, just and cheap tourist tourist gifts, um, and the noise and smells and sights were, were really overpowering. Um, all the pilgrims they're all walking to a to a pool to bathe in, um, and men and women and children stripped off and washed themselves in the rather brown and murky water. The men and women kept to their own separate areas. Uh, it was almost a biblical scene, uh, certainly surrounded by a cacophony of chanting, wailing, uh, bells were, were tolling, uh, there's monkeys leaping around everywhere and screeching, uh, cows mooing, uh, whilst there's incense wafting through the, the air, mixing with a fairly sort of acrid smell of cows, goats and, and numerous, numerous monkeys. Um, now on the way back to the fort, uh, we called in to, um, to, to Bonnie's cousin, uh, Devendra, uh, who was very, very keen to show us his, his stable of, of Marwari horses uh, and also, also camels. Uh, uh, Devendra had about 60 Marwari horses, uh, on which he also took, took visitors on, on safaris. And again, like, like most places in India, there is an abundance of animals yeah, running free around the around the, the yard, the fields and the stables. Uh, when we eventually got back to fort, um, back to the fort there was some entertainment um, had been put on for, for some for some tourists that were there that were staying there uh, that were partaking in a, in, a, in a horse riding safari uh, and there was dancing uh, music uh, fire eating and and, and juggling. Uh, we were able to we ate outside. It was it was it was well, it's still a little bit chilly, but we had some 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 fires. Uh, we had some some nice food, and we also had some Indian wine, which I've never experienced in my life, which was yeah, which was very very nice. Um, health health and safety. Um, it sort of exists in a very 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 different dimension uh, in India to what. To what we're used to in the Western world. Um, 
And I think a lot of the time, you know, fate purely was really was in the in the lack of of the gods, particularly uh, those involved with the with the construction industry. Uh, whilst we were there, there was a, a French a film crew. Um, they spent a few days recording a documentary about the Moari horse, uh, part of which included an interview with Bernard about the work of the Flying Anvil Foundation uh, and also about the Institute in Dunlop. Now, for the students, we composed a very, a very simple method uh, to teach them a, a truing protocol which was safe, repeatable, and reliable. And it helped to use marker pens to sort of highlight anatomical reference points just to help them with their trimming. Vets, vets in India are, are very, very rare, uh, particularly yeah, in rural India. And often, more often than not, yeah, time is, is the greatest healer. Um, this horse it took a took a bad kick to the leg whilst out on safari uh, and spent yeah, six months in box rest uh, until it was deemed fit and well to come back into work. Time spent with the intermediate uh, farriers uh, in the introduction to cold shoeing. Uh, this is using um, Indian machine-made shoes. Uh, which were which were quite soft. Um, and attention to detail was was emphasised um, from assessing confirmation to finally clenching up the last foot. With these farriers, it was it was really getting them to think about to think first before doing anything, um, as they had some sort of quite a, well some fairly a few entrenched bad habits, and uh, they're very keen to sort of you know jump in and start trimming feet so we just had to try and get them to slow down and think about you know what they were doing looking at the feet looking at the confirmation before they started you know pulling pulling shoes off and, and getting stuck into trimming up feet and um yeah they produced some really really good solid work and it was just really good just to get them to, to slow down uh, and to think through their rationale before they started before they started trimming feet we all, all the students, we spent some time um, just forging just some basic stamps and prituals. Um, this is demonstrated to the students and, it, and obviously their, their purpose was explained um, to them all because none of them had, had any real sort of forging experiences. Um, and the resources for, for tool steel in India are, are very, very restricted. Uh, so we had to use steel from, um, from vehicles, from suspension springs because this is a harder steel. To make the pritchels, uh, we were cutting off about two inches of, of spring steel, which was then welded to a length of, of rebar. Um, the stamps were forged from spring steel also, uh, and were then welded to a steel handle. The good thing was that yeah, the students were, were able to match the stamp and pritchel to ensure that these would give them crisp nail holes, the tools we call the tools in the in the sand uh, to, to temper them and to ensure it retained the, the cutting edges of the tools. The rudiments of fullering were, were demonstrated to, to the, the more experienced farriers. Um, they the, the steel that we were using was was really a lot harder than the sort of the mild steel that we would use that I'm used to using in the UK. Uh, and a lot well probably half the time was actually spent sort of renovating the tools after use because it was a uh, extremely punishing on the on on the on the tools on the fullers and the stamps and the pritchels. Uh, but I think yeah the first the first attempts were you know were, were quite inspiring, were very inspiring, and um, yeah they were able to improve yeah you know, with 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 further practice. The first was at a local agricultural college. Um, now these these wells. They're very, very commonplace in India. Um, back in the back in the day, they would have uh, these would water been raised up by camels or, or oxen, and then you know, put in put into these wells. Uh, and some of these wells, I mean, are up to 400 feet deep, um, and are quite frightening. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they're very, very commonplace just purely because of how how dry and arid it is. 
uh, the horses, all the horses we saw there, they're generally sort of, they're, they're tethered uh, and also hob hobbled. Um, the cows that we saw there are mainly used for, for pulling cars, carts. Uh, they're not eaten um, as cattle or cows are perceived as being sacred. Uh, most Indians are, are also vegetarian. Um, these two fields, they're, they're side by side. It's just a demonstration of, uh, of how important it is to, to be able to irrigate the fields out there because it is so very, very dry and very, very arid. You know, crops would just not be able to survive if they were left you know, naturally. Again, all the cattle were tethered. Uh, it's very commonplace for them to be controlled for, as a draft animal, be controlled by a piece of twine that goes up, up through their nostril and out through their, their mouths. Um, and the horses that we come to trim, uh, they were all they were all tethered. They were all hobbled together. Uh, some were stallions, and uh, and some were mares. Um, and the horses that we come to to trim, they've been visited the previous day uh, by a local farrier. Uh, and in India, it's it's yeah, it's fairly common for for the Indian farriers to use a, a hammer and a chisel. Yeah, to trim feet with, uh, which doesn't, yeah, it's probably not best practice. Um, and having seen the state of the feet that have been trimmed made me, really made me appreciate the need for, for farrowing training in India and how how important it was to be able to develop a sustainable program for, yeah, for this to evolve and for this to, be, to, to develop. Um, the owner of these horses, yeah, he, he thought it was fairly normal that horses would be lame for a few weeks after they've been trimming. Uh, we had a good good chat with the owner of the horses, uh, and he said that his farrier would be interested to come down to the institute to see, you know, what what training what the training was involved with the students down there. In the centre of Navagar, um, a street blacksmith works literally on the on the pavement of the street. Uh, his anvil was a simple metal block on the ground. Um, and his forge was was run by a blower, which was driven by his wife turning a bicycle wheel. Um, his fire was a pit in the ground, uh, certainly very, very different uh, to my own propane forge with its electric ignition. Um, they really made me think how simple it is. We, you yeah, know, we just take, we accept our, our modern tools uh, without any great thought. Uh, but just to be able to create heat for these people is, you know, it's a, it's a mammoth task. And again, very, very labour intensive. Um, the horses in, in the centre of town, uh, they're all kind of kept to the, the equivalent of our of our taxi rank. Uh, and the horses are called upon to transport you know, people and goods. Obviously, they require you know, good hoof care to be able to maintain their soundness. Uh, they have to work for very, very long hours. Um, and the students, led by Sahib, were involved in you know, a really positive discussion with the, with the owners about the importance of, of, of good farrowing and what can what can be offered to keep these horses sound. And in India, the, the extent of, of draft animals is 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 limitless. Um, animals of every description, from camels to ox to cattle to, to elephants. Yeah, it's, again, it's a very very common sight in rural India. Near the ancient town of Mandawa, uh, our driver that took us out, he explained explained how this would, would have been guarded in the olden days by a eunuch on each corner, armed with uh, bows and arrows to protect the women that were, were bathing. Uh, and throughout India, I was amazed the extent of handmade silk scarves, uh, which are absolutely beautiful, and which were a fraction of the cost uh, that I would be paying for back home. And the streets were typically very very chaotic but yeah, quite wonderful too um, and there was an abundance of uh, fresh garlic fruit and vegetables uh, which indicated or gave an indication of the land round Mandawa was far more fertile to what was round Dunglond which is yeah, very very dry and very very arid uh, and we were also we were able to take the opportunity of having some quite elaborate uh, handmade leather shoes yeah which were tailor made for ourselves um, it's just just when I thought I had seen everything possible in India, um, I caught sight of this um, 
well, probably the ultimate baby rocker in a, in a, in a, in a backyard. Uh, this baby was, was sat here, whirling around um, as the oxen was used to mill cereal. And all the all the buildings in 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 Mandawa were absolutely beautifully decorated. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, but a lot of them did were, were derelict. Um, as the population of the town have, have plummeted just purely because of a, a lack of employment. Uh, now this is your typical wedding horse, uh, a dancing white stallion, which we used to bring. Uh, the bride and groom separately to the wedding ceremony, uh, beautifully decorated. Uh, some of the bits that are, are used on these horses do do seem to be quite quite severe. And one of the horses, one of the dancing horses uh, we saw was was laminitic and was quite tender on its feet. Its feet were were pretty long, uh, and the heels and the toes had my had migrated forward. Uh, resulting in quite a distorted hoof, as well as it had a quite a convex sole, and uh, the white line was distended, um, indicating yeah, laminal tearing. Its gait was was very had a very pronounced heel first landing, um, and to improve the the foot distortion and reduce pain, the heels and the toes were were trimmed back to yeah, to normal proportions. And uh, the shoe was fitted uh, to reduce the breakover moment. Uh, the vertical line uh, shows the termination of the heels on the bearing border prior to trimming. And these horses, they get fed a huge amount of carrots in their diet. So, yeah, acute and chronic laminitis is, is a fairly common condition. And after this horse had been, been shod, it appeared more comfortable. Um, they had a wedding to attend to that afternoon so you know it was little respite for this horse and the caste system it, yeah, it still exists in India um, and equality between genders mean both men and women have to do the same menial task um, this young girl was helping to rebuild some of the stable walls um, the bangles which she's got round on her on her upper arm uh, were made of plastic but uh, you know, years ago, they, these would have been made out of ivory. And the students, they were, you know, they were outstanding, uh, had very, very hungry minds, and they were they were keen to learn. Um, probably no no different to any other farrier across the world. Now, two of the students, um, Sudesh and Ashok, um, were, they were mounted police officers. Uh, and on our trip back to the airport, they were really, really keen to show us Show us their headquarters, um, where they where they train. Um, so we're able to see the horses being ridden uh, in the outdoor school and seeing the recruit putting through their paces on the parade ground, and have a good look around the facilities at, at, at the academy. Um, we were also we were able to meet one of the one of the farriers who worked there. Uh, he was army trained, uh, which is really the only recognised way of, of Ferry training in India. Uh, his shoes, they were all handmade, uh, plain stamp shoes, uh, which he made on a charcoal for, forge, which was uh, electronically driven. And he was probably paid about, ran right about six dollars for a, for a full set of four shoes. So this is, yeah, this is our farewell, our farewell to India. Um, and this, this sign at the bottom here was a I saw this on the on the, one of the first few days we were actually in in Dunblod. I thought it really did it encapsulated the positivity which is shown in you know, in in many aspects of of Indian life because uh, you know from what we could see in rural India, you know, life is life is is pretty pretty tough, very very different to what we're experiencing in the UK. Um, so with that we were you know, we departed back to the UK um, for old Taylor went back to the, went back to the, to the USA um, and that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation uh, and I'd like to just extend my thanks to Soundhorse Technologies um, for being able to sponsor this webinar thank you okay very good Mark thank you they were very enlightening and uh, we'll go to our question and answer session now uh, we have a few questions already
Uh, Mark, let, let's start with this one about the uh, materials used. Is uh, they they don't necessarily will have an avenue to improve the quality of the the stock they'll use. So you were more or less teaching better practices and forging the shoes. Yeah, it was it was it was mainly about you know you're working with the whatever you got available to you. Um, and I think really the steel that's imported that was brought to the Institute until you actually started forging with it, it was very, very difficult to sort of ascertain the, the, yeah, the, the quality of it. And I think whether it's you know, tool, tools that are coming in or whether it's just, just the mild steel. Um, I mean, it was meant to be mild steel, but it was, it was, extremely, it was extremely hard. And just to, yeah, you probably need about two heats just to get a, just to get a toe bend. Yeah, very, very different to, you know, to what I'm used to, in, certainly in the UK. Um, and the, the, for, the gas forges that we're using in the Institute, you know, they're, they're Colony forges, fantastic forges, but even they weren't able to heat the, you know, the metal up sufficiently. Well, they, weren't, they were able to heat it up sufficiently, but the metal had such a high carbon content, it made it very, very difficult to forge. Um, and likewise with the, the tools that are imported out there, until you start to use the tools, you're not that familiar with how, you know, how good the, the steel is out there, and what quality it is. Okay. And uh, could you talk a little bit about the the goals uh, once you left? What are the goals for the students to continue their education? Well, the group the group that Taylor and I taught they were the they were the the first group. So they were that was the first uh, training session, first one of four. Uh, I believe I think the next the next session I think was in I think in uh, in time. And then they had a break over the summer because it gets very, very hot there. And there are two, there are two other uh, modules. Uh, the last one being in in the November time when all the a attending students they sit a formal examination in order to give them the certification at the, yeah, at the end of that one year's module. Okay. And then uh, could you talk a little bit about the background of the students? You had a couple of uh, police officers, or uh, did they have? Equine background or metalworking backgrounds? They were they they had they had horse backgrounds. So I mean the um, the mounted officers they are responsible for for the you know, the care and maintenance of their horse on a day to day basis. But this yeah you know, this doesn't involve shoeing or farrier or anything like that. So the um, these these two lads from the from the Jaipur police were sent to the institute. Because they, the, um, the the police federation out there want to be more involved in farrying and want want the um, the mounted officers to be able to to learn farrying and be more um, be more proactive in being able to look after their own horses and being able to you know, have farrying more in 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 house at the at the um, the police academy. Um, so they, I mean. Mounted police are used up, you know, used out there uh, an awful lot for, for patrolling the streets, um, and also for competitions as well. I think um, I think Su Sudesh, uh, I think he was a, the second the second best show, uh, show jumping show jumper um, within the police forces across the whole of of of, um, of India. So I mean, they're very very able horse people, um, and yet again, some of the other students there had no neither farrowy or horse experience um, but i think i think in india um they're so used to just having to make use of what they've got i mean they're all very very able to um you know adapt their practicals to skills to whatever is whatever is necessary whether it's you know fitting a tar on a vehicle or you know fitting a shoe on a horse okay and here's a question more general about the Flying Anvil Foundation. It's actually a couple of questions. Uh, could you review again like how long the stay is? Uh, how did you or how would you recommend getting involved? And uh, uh, how, how do women farriers, uh, uh, how, how do they fare in, uh, in these uh, different countries? Um, I mean, they're fair. They're very, you know, very, very well. Same as any other farrier, because you because you got to be good, because you've got a, because you've got a skill, uh, because the students are, you know, very, very keen to learn. Um, it doesn't really matter what gender that person is that's teaching them. Uh, and then it, you've had uh, Jenny Hagen from Germany. Uh, and there's been, been there's been quite a few quite a few female female vets and farriers that have been out there to teach 
at the institute in Rajasthan. They've, you know, they've all been you know, extremely well accepted out there. So I mean, I don't think there doesn't exist any you know, any gender issues out there. They're just very very keen to learn, uh, and they're very very appreciative of of those going out there to learn. It was a very very humbling experience. Um, first time I met some of the students. Yeah, they were they were bowing down and, and crying because they were so they were so pleased that someone had gone to you know had gone to teach them something um it was something i've never experienced before uh and it was it was it was it was difficult to accept very very humbly they're very very keen to learn okay and uh here's a question from someone who taught hoof care in vietnam uh how, how much you, you talked a little bit about the laminate cases how much do you discuss uh other foot diseases or or equine health altogether with with the students just i mean the the students that we were teaching it's the first time they've been on this course some of them had yeah had were quite experienced some of them have been showing for a few years so has had some experience it's just trying to kind of try and keep it very very basic um we did we had the resources out there of being able to do uh, dissections, uh, and we had some of the Ali Hayes um, uh, freeze-dried models out there as well. So we were able to explain quite clear, quite clearly um, by demonstrating on you know, these, these structures, these, these models with you know, varying degrees of you know, pathology and things like that. But it's, it's trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, you know, mindful of the fact that. That a lot of what we're saying is, is then getting translated um, back in back into into Hindi. Um, so it's trying to keep things simple so it does not get lost in translation. Yeah. How, how would you recommend getting involved with the Flying Anvil Foundation? Uh, probably the best way would be to contact them via their Facebook page. Okay. And uh, how how long was the is the stay and uh, or how long was your stay and is it still the same model they're using? It's, yeah, it's still now, uh, because it's becoming more sustainable. Um, when Taylor and I went out there, um, they were looking at having two, two, two Ferry instructors going out there to teach. Um, now that, yeah, Sahib is, yeah, he's, he's very experienced now, as well as being the translator. Uh, it just, it necessitates just, you know, one instructor can, can go out there and is, is able to, you know, do that do that much more you know, on, on their own now because it, it, again it's becoming more sustainable you've got you know previous students out there that are you know willing and able to you know, to help in the with the training with the with the new students that are coming along yeah. uh, how would you describe the average hoof care knowledge of the students who are maybe a bit more horse experienced than the others They, I mean, they were they were able to get they were able to show a horse uh, mm -hmm. without a without a problem. Um, but the probably most difficult thing was just trying to sort of unpick bad habits um, and and have a look at what they were doing. I mean, they were very very they're very very keen to yeah you know, to get under horses and start pulling shoes off and start showing feet without really thinking about what it, what exactly am I doing without you know looking at the feet, looking at the conformation. Um, seeing any signs of any sort of pathology, uh, looking at the horse move prior to you know, even picking feet up. Um, so with those who basically sort of having to sort of rewind the clock and just get them to think a little bit before they got, you know, they get st stuck into feet. But I mean, I don't think that's necessarily a trait that's, you know, just, you know, regarding Indian farriers. I think, it, you know, that trait probably exists with, you know, with, with a lot of, with a lot of farriers anyway. Yeah. All right, here's a person who, who's been to India and, and uh, saw a lot of the same uh, trimming, shoeing, the similar lameness issues, um, as well as some other other countries. Uh, did you get a feel of what the trimming and shoeing needs were for the various environments of India or, or just specifically localized to, to, the, to this area you were in? Crikey, um, it's it's pretty difficult to say really because we were sort of, I mean, where we, we were there for two weeks and we were fairly restricted to yeah you know, to the area of Rajasthan that we were in, um, so I can't I wouldn't be able to give it any further information about that. Uh, I think Bernard would probably be the best person to speak with because I mean he or contact via Facebook because I mean he's yeah he's worked all around India. 
Okay. And uh, here, here we have our last question. Uh, what did you take back specifically that, that influenced your, your hoof care work? How much I take for granted, <laughs> really. Uh, you know, in the West world, just it's so used to being, you know, almost, almost mollycoddled with, you know, the sh the, our tools, our shoes, uh, the equipment they're using, the vehicles we're driving, um, the horses that we're working upon, um, yeah, how, we're, how we are appreciated as professionals, how we're able to enter into dialogue with, you know, with, with other um, equine professionals, you know, such as you know, vets, saddlers, dietitians, et cetera, physiotherapists. Um, yeah, that does not, it doesn't exist out there, um, mainly because you know, Fowry is not actually recognized as, you know, as an occupation.